Welcome to Healthline 3, I'm Jade Balexa. When it comes to knee injuries, there are different treatment options. Dr. Mar Mark Callanan of the Orthopedic Clinic at Willis Knighton Health System joins me now for an in-depth look. Dr. Callanan, thank you so much for being here. Always happy to be here. Absolutely. Well, remember, you can call us with your questions at 318-219-4569. Well, let's get started here. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit why people develop knee pain. So there's a lot of common reasons uh, why people develop knee pain. If you said, what are probably the top three reasons people come in to see me? Um, number one, certainly people can develop arthritis. And when you hear the term arthritis, what that simply means is you have cartilage on the end of the bones, on both your top of your shin bone here and the end of your femur bone here. And just from living life, over time that's gonna wear out it's just like tires on a car or anything else some people are more prone to it than others if you've had a previous knee injury um, even dating back as early as high school uh, you could have injured that cartilage and that may predispose you down the road to getting arthritis uh, but that simply means you're starting to lose some of that cartilage and that the cartilage is a little cushion it is, allows the joint to glide and that's one of the number one reasons people come in and they develop knee pain when somebody says I have bone on bone arthritis all they're talking about is if I get an x-ray the space between the bones on the x-ray represents the cartilage you have left. So if the bones are touching, that really means that, okay, you've got more advanced arthritis, and then the treatment options become a little bit more limited. Now, what I do as a sports uh, orthopedic surgeon um, is I treat everything up until knee replacement. Now, sometimes if you come in and you're completely bone on bone, and there's no joint space left, I'm gonna refer you for either total knee arthroplasty, which is basically resurfacing everything with metal and plastic, and a lot of my great partners do knee replacements. Um, but leading up to that, uh, most people when they come in, and let's say you do have bad arthritis, there are other options prior to jumping in and getting a knee replacement done injections with either steroid, there's some gel injections that used to be called rooster comb because they used to actually use uh, a derivative of the rooster comb itself. It's basically a gel-like substance that gives some cushion and some lubrication where you may have lost that uh, cartilage over time. Uh, and those with prescription anti-inflammatories are kind of the mainstay treatments for arthritis, which again is one of the more common reasons that people may come in. Okay, so when when should someone go see you? When should someone come to the doctor? I think most people, by the time they see me, it's you know either been weeks or months of this pain where it's something that they might have had occasional aches and pains in the past, uh, but this is now becoming something that's more sustained and where their lifestyle is impaired, they find themselves limping, waking up at night, and it's not getting better with the simple things like ice, modifying their activity, taking over-the-counter anti-inflammatories or Tylenol. That's usually when, okay, there may be something more structurally wrong, it might be time to get in and see an orthopedist. Mm -hmm. And what, what would an evaluation uh, consist of? Yeah, so evaluations for me, I mean, there's kind of two categories patients fall into, especially with knee pain. You have the people with what's called insidious onset of knee pain where they wake up one day and they just start developing that pain and it's not going away and it's kind of getting worse over time. That's more of my arthritis degenerative category typically. And then you have patients that have had trauma. They stepped off, they twisted the knee, felt a pop, they were doing something, exercise out in the yard, you know, or my younger athletes, you know, high school athletes, especially right now with football and everything ramping up during practice, they get hit, they plant, they feel a pop in their knee. So there's kind of, you know, categories versus uh, having an injury itself or just waking up one day and feeling knee pain. So based on that, that's really where our evaluation starts getting a little bit more tailored. Now, everybody for the first time when they come in to see me is gonna get an X-ray. That gives me just a baseline, you know, when you're talking about the younger athletes, okay, are their growth plates still open? Um, do they still have good cartilage surfaces? There's no obvious bony abnormalities. And then for my older patients, we can get a baseline of how much arthritis a patient has, you know, especially if that's kind of the route that I'm thinking we're going. And based on that in the clinical exam, I can kind of say, okay, this is what I think is going on, and these are kind of what our treatment options are. But mm -hmm. we start simple and kind of work our way up. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you stay busy with all the athletes oh, yeah. that we have here in the Arclatex. Absolutely, um, especially when things start warming up. I mean, really year-round, sports go year-round. So that's a big portion of my uh, patient population are the young high school, you know, adolescent high school, all the way up until my weekend warriors or people still just exercising, they like running, they like doing athletic things on the weekend, they end up hurting themselves too. Mm -hmm. 
And so, um, yeah, it's kind of a, it, it really is a broad spectrum and it's a year round broad spectrum of patients that we see. What would you say is the most commonly seen sports related injury? I would say meniscal tears is probably the most common. And again, that can kind of fall into two categories. So to reiterate on the meniscus, if you were to look at the top side of the bone here, and this is your shin bone right here, you have these two little half moon shaped discs that are little cushions. They're basically little shock absorbers that sit on the top of your shin bone. And they help cushion things with that cartilage and they help preserve kind of knee health. And you know, with the cartilage, they basically uh, are, uh, give you stability, support, and you know, allow you to function. So what can happen with these discs is there's two things. One, you could step off a curb and the bones can pinch and basically tear these things. And that's more on the traumatic side of things. I have football players, they get hit. They you know, land awkwardly, they twist, these things can you know, tear, get pinched, and it's really getting pinched in between the bones. Now on the opposite end of the spectrum, patients don't necessarily even have to have had an injury or an inciting event. These things, just like the cartilage over time, if it's taken a beating over time, they can break down. So sometimes when people wake up and they say, I'm having a lot of pain here, um, you know, it's one of those things where they may just have a degenerative tear where just like the cartilage wearing out over time, they've gotten a little split in that meniscus and that could be another source of pain for a lot of patients. Mm. Wow, that, saying, that sounds painful. Either way, either if it's degenerative or, mm -hmm. or, you know, playing a sport. Well, we have Gladys on the phone right now. Uh, Gladys, hello, hope you're doing well. Tell us the question you have for Dr. Caladan. I would like to ask him, is the MRI better for diagnosing pain in the knee than just regular x-rays? And also, what is the treatment for pseudo-gout in the knee? Uh, good question. So to answer the first part, which was excellent, um, when people ask all the time, what's, what's the difference between an x-ray or an MRI or when to get one versus the other? X-rays are always the quickest thing to get. It's a really fast exam. We could do it in clinic. It gives me a baseline if somebody fell, make sure they don't have a fracture, see how much arthritis a patient has, you know, kind of what we talked about before. An MRI allows us to see everything we don't see on the x-ray, all the soft tissue structures. So if I'm worried about a meniscus tear, we can get an MRI that will show us those meniscus in fine detail. If I'm worried about a ligament or a tendon injury, again, soft tissue structures won't show up on an x-ray. So if you have good joint space and you don't come in and you're not kind of advanced arthritis and I'm worried about a meniscus tear, um, certainly an MRI would be an option for you. If you are you know, an athlete in football practice and you twist your knee and it's all swollen and I'm worried you might have torn your ACL, your anterior cruciate ligament or your PCL, or one of your tendon ruptures. Um, that's the time to get an MRI. So I don't think it's necessarily better. It all depends on what you're trying to look at for in the diagnosis. And certainly if you don't have bone on bone arthritis, it's viable to get an MRI to give you more detailed information. On number one, I can see the cartilage surfaces in finer detail. I could look at the meniscus and really see if those are broken down and kind of confirm a meniscus tear. And sometimes you can even see how much fluid a patient has in the knee, which is a sign of inflammation, see if there's any debris or loose bodies floating around. And that's really where an MRI would come into play. Now for pseudogout in the knee, that's a, a little bit of more of an inflammatory uh, diagnosis. Uh, pseudogout is basically crystals, which unlike gout where people think about it, the crystals being in the big toe traditionally, pseudogout is a different type of crystal that can actually form in the larger joints. So it's an inflammatory condition, the knee balloons up, it looks hot and red. A lot of times we're worried about an infection and we draw fluid off and send it off to look at cell count and crystal analysis and usually looking under the microscope we can confirm pseudogout. Now pseudogout is one of those things where we treat with medication. Um, if it was really an inflammatory condition, uh, could there be utility for a washout if people were really struggling? Uh, you certainly could, but most of the time, if you treat them with medications like colchicine and endomethacin, which are traditional gout medications, people get better a lot quicker. And you don't need to do anything more than that. Okay. How did you with regular gout medication? Yeah, a lot of times you certainly can. The anti-inflammatories are always the mainstay, but certainly if you've had gout in the past, colchicine is another one that patients will take, and that can certainly help alleviate symptoms too. All right, thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. All right, well, that was a great question from, from Gladys. That was a good question. And, mm -hmm. and I will say the MRIs too, um, it, it, 
Again, I'm more inclined when a patient comes in and it's not just chronic knee pain. If it's somebody where they actually felt a pop, they were doing something, their knee's really swollen, they can't put weight on it, that's usually the time that we would jump to an MRI kind of right out the gate. Mm -hmm. And that allows me, again, if I have an athlete, you know, we'll say on my younger population that comes in and they can't walk with a big swollen knee, sometimes it's really hard to get a good clinical exam. I could say, hey, I think it's meniscus. I think it's, you know, your ACL is torn. Uh, but ultimately that MRI is gonna help kind of confirm these things. And I think when we're talking about other injuries that I would look for on an MRI, just kind of backing up to the structures, we talked about the meniscus already, the two little shock absorber disc, which is one of the most common causes for people having pain. But also in this model here, you can see these structures that are running from the thigh bone up here all the way down to the shin bone in the middle. You have two ligaments and they're called the ACL and the PCL, anterior cruciate ligament and posterior cruciate ligament. What they do is they give stability to the knee from rocking back and forth. So they help keep that knee from buckling. They give constraint when you're doing day-to-day -day activities. Then you have one on the inside here, that's the MCL or medial collateral ligament, and another complex called the lateral collateral ligament, and they give that side-to-side -side stability of the knee. Those are less likely injured, but you know many times if somebody twists a knee, any of these structures around the knee can be injured. And that's where an MRI would have utility in kind of the acute injury phase to kind of evaluate and see exactly what's been injured. Um, moving on from that, when we're talking about structures again, just to kind of give information, because I like to make sure that patients understand. You know, I think doctors throw out a lot of terms and sometimes it can get overwhelming. And so using this model, anytime we're talking about a ligament, it's a bone to bone connection. It's given stability to a joint. When you say something like a tendon, a tendon is a muscle to bone connection. So this up here is your kneecap. And what this represents here is your quad tendon. So your quadriceps muscle in the front of your leg goes down and terminates to this tendon that attaches to your kneecap. And then your patellar tendon attaches from the kneecap down to your lower, your shin bone up here on the tibial tubercle, this little prominence. Now that allows you to make the connection of that muscle to extend your leg out. And so the tendons are again, muscle to bone connection. And they usually allow for mobilization across a joint whereas the ligaments are bone to bone and those are more stability. That's just the general semantics. People can certainly rupture quad tendons. I've seen people pop patellar tendons. Trampoline parks are notorious for that. And it's something that, again, we could fix. And then again, since we're kind of talking about all scopes of knee injuries that we see, one common thing that I see is people can dislocate that kneecap. And that's usually, again, in younger patients where it tends to go out to the side and there's a variety of factors that can contribute to that, but also not uncommon, especially with athletics and sports, um, we see it quite frequently. What kind of surgery do you do when when a kneecap is dislocated? <laughs> well, that depends on a variety of things. There's different things to think about. My analogy that I try to give to patients is thinking about the patella in the groove here being like a boat in a boat trailer. Mm -hmm. So if you think about a boat trailer, if you had a flat trailer and you try to pull a boat up, it's gonna slide around. The depth of the groove here, and that's just the way people develop, you can imagine the flatter groove, they're gonna be more prone for this thing to slide back and forth. So that's one thing that's less controllable. The other thing to think about is the direction of pull, just the way you've developed, where this tendon attaches down to the lower leg. So think about pulling a boat up onto a trailer. If you pull it right up the middle, it's gonna slide up easily. If you're pulling it from the side, it may hit the side wow. wall and wanna jump off. And that's one of those factors, again, you may have just been born unlucky. And then lastly, if you can imagine this thing popping out to one side versus the other, you have some structures on both sides that give some stability like little seat belts on there. So inevitably, if it's forced out of the way, it tears those structures typically on the inside. It's called the medial patellofemoral ligament. The most common procedure that we do if a patient doesn't get better with bracing, therapy, and you know a trial of non-operative management is what's called an MPFL reconstruction, where we actually take a ligament. You can harvest it from the patient or use a cadaver. We anchor it at the side and anchor it over here, and we reestablish that little seat belt. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah. It's just so neat to see this structure because you really get an understanding. I'm a visual person yeah. and I'm sure people at home are able to understand it better when you actually are yeah. able to see it. Um, we have Buddy on the line right now. Buddy, thank you so much for calling. What is your question? Well, it's not about my knee, it's about my hip. Do you have, uh, do you guys work on hips also? <laughs> I have some partners that do almost exclusively hips. I don't do many hips. 
outside of fractures when I'm on call. <laughs> Do they have one of those little uh, displays like you have in your hand for the hip? Oh yeah, they definitely do. They have the anatomy ones, they have, if you need a hip replacement, they have ones that show the actual prosthesis models. They kind of have the whole gamut too. Okay, well, thank you very much. Yes, sir. Thank you, buddy. So t tell us more about um, the MR MRI is real interesting. So everybody who comes in gets an x-ray, mm -hmm. of course. Um, tell us more about when you would you would use the MRI. Yeah, absolutely. So as we touched on with an acute injury where somebody can't walk, it's ballooned up, I'm worried about a ligament tear, I'm worried about you know having a, an acute meniscus tear. Um, those are ones where I'm more inclined right out the gate to get an MRI. A lot of patients, if they come in and they're in a category where they're not bone on bone arthritis, but I am worried about more of a degenerative meniscus tear, you don't immediately have to jump to an MRI. You could say, hey, even if you do have a little tear in here, that's kind of part of the natural wear and tear of the knee. You can imagine as you lose some of that cartilage, that shock absorber, which is the meniscus, starts taking more of a beating and it can break down. So if you were to take a subset of patients in their 40s and 50s and 60s that were active, whether or not they had knee pain and sit them down and do MRIs, you're gonna find a lot of meniscus tears and some of them may not even be symptomatic. So some people can compensate for having a tear. So that's why if they tear it, you don't have to jump right into surgery. A lot of times, even if I'm suspecting it and they still have decent joint space, we'll start with something simple, prescription anti-inflammatory, steroid injection. And some people that'll break kind of that cycle of inflammation, they feel better, they kind of get back to where they were and we don't have to do anything more than that unless they're having pain. But let's say we do some of these things and they give it a couple weeks and I usually see people back pretty quick because I want to make sure they're getting better and they're still limping, they're still having pain, they either had short term relief or not complete relief. Well, then it's a conversation. Hey, let's get an MRI because we may need to think about surgery. Now, when it comes to meniscus tears, uh, the younger patients that we have, um, they have the best propensity to heal an actual tear. The meniscus itself is a pretty grisly little piece of tissue and there's really not a great blood supply to it. So once it's torn, it's almost like having a hangnail and that's my analogy in clinic. When you have a hangnail, a lot of times if you're sitting here doing nothing, it doesn't tend to bother you. But the second you twist, squat down, you know, pivot off that knee and it grabs you with that pain, that's like snagging that hangnail. So that hangnail is never gonna grow back to the nail bed. It doesn't have a great blood supply. It's just not as uh, cellular or vascular, meaning, you know, again, blood supply or have a propensity to heal back. So it's gonna stay there until you take care of it. So that's similar to what most patients, especially my middle-aged patients when they have meniscus tears, what we do, it's more of a cleanup job if we go to surgery. It's just like trimming off the little portion that's torn. Now, just like with the hangnail, you don't rip out the entire nail bed. You just trim off the little portion that's torn so we can go in arthroscopically, two little poke holes in a camera and I can look around and if that meniscus is torn and I could see that little flap that's getting stuck in the joint, a lot of times we're just trimming that up and we leave as much of the good meniscus behind but take away that little portion that keeps getting stuck between causing the pinching, the catching, the locking and the swelling. Now in younger patients, simply because we know the meniscus helps you know, with overall knee health and preserving them from getting arthritis down the road, we don't want to go in there and take out a big chunk of meniscus unless it was absolutely not repairable. But once you get patients kind of mid thirties and up, it's much harder for us to heal a meniscus tear. And the meniscus recovery is like, you know, being on crutches for four to six weeks, being in a brace, it's usually three to four months to get back to activity. Versus if you go in there and just clean things up, I let people walk on it immediately. And I say, do whatever you feel comfortable, crutches for comfort only. So it's much quicker. And so in my middle-aged population, most of the time we're just doing a little trim up. In my teenager, if I got somebody that's 14 and got to have that meniscus and try to preserve that thing because they got a long, you know, they got decades of life ahead where we want to try to keep them from getting arthritis and give them the best knee function, I'm going to try everything possible to repair that thing. And usually, you know, at that age of life, it's a little bit easier to put somebody on crutches for four to six weeks and give them a three to four month recovery versus an adult that's like, look, I got a job, I got kids, I got things to do. And you know, if they don't have a great chance of healing it anyway, and they're starting to get some arthritis, that's where in my older population tends to be more of a trim up, younger population, we try to fix the most that we can. Mm -hmm. Well, we have Marguerite on the line. Marguerite, are, are you there? I'm here. Okay, can you can you tell us your question? Uh, yes, uh, some 30 plus years, I had my right knee replaced. And I, I chose not to have the left knee replaced. But anyway, um, I 
Bill Smarty is back there and yes, Jerry Lord Chapman who had me uh, in the fall off when they made these words. But this time I have something else going on. My left knee, not no, no, my left thigh is swollen. And uh, my primary physician sent me to get uh, a test for blood clots. And if there's no blood clot there, I am awaiting other doctors to look at this. But I would like to know, uh, doctor, what would cause the knee to be swollen? I mean, not the knee, I'm sorry. What would cause the thigh to be swollen? That's one I mean, of those. That's one of those questions that's actually probably hard to answer without examining you and kind of seeing, you know, what could possibly cause in your thigh to swell. You, the knee joint itself does have a pouch that extends up to kind of the distal thigh or the end of your thigh. And when you have a lot of fluid on it, it will look like your thigh is swelling a little bit. That could be still coming from your knee. If it's further up the chain, I mean, there's a lot of things. People can tear muscles, people can get um, blood clots. I think it's good you ruled that out. That would be the first thing I would check on. Um, but people can have a variety of vascular or lymphatic, which is basically what controls the fluid flow back and forth through the legs. Um, they can have incompetencies on a level like that that can cause swelling. So there's many, many things, and it's really difficult, I think, without actually seeing somebody and examining to give you a good answer on that. Okay, well. I, like I said, it has, it has amazed me how fat this left thigh is, and the right thigh seems like it, it's gotten smaller. So uh, I'm awaiting uh, do, uh, doctors to do some more examining. But it, it's, I know my knee is still, uh, I have problems with the knee, and I know it's bone on bone, and, I, and I've learned how to live with that knee still or injection or what have you. But for the entire thigh to be so fat and puffy, it's, it's amazing. So thank you for your input, and I will be seeing my other doctors come next week. All right. Thank you so much, Marguerite, for, for your phone call. That's, that's yeah. interesting. Interesting. It's interesting tough to say. Issue. And I will say yeah. some people with bad knee arthritis, they can have kind of whole leg edema, as we call it, or swelling. Mm -hmm. Could be stemming from that. It's really tough to say over the phone without seeing it, you know, exactly where it's swollen and what it looks like. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, okay. And we have another phone call. Gosh, knee <laughs> knee issues are, are really They're common. Very common. Okay. Um, doctor, tell us your your question. Oh, I'm Hello? sorry. Gary, tell us your question. I, I've had one knee replaced, and it's doing good. <clears throat> I have another one that's bone on bone, and it doesn't hurt like all, at night or anything like that. Or when I don't move, it doesn't hurt. But only when I walk on it, I do feel it, but it's not excruciating. I was wondering, do you think it would do any good to do the rooster comb shot? I will, I will tell you this, that I, I have had patients and the rooster comb, I think, has the best effectiveness when somebody's not completely bone on bone. But that being said, the side effect profile is very good. So when I have a patient that is bone on bone and I'm saying, hey, you are a candidate for a knee replacement, and to stress again to your point, a knee replacement is an elective procedure. We can look at x-rays and tell you how bad things look, but nobody can tell you you have to have a knee replacement. So if you're telling me, hey, this is intermittent pain, I know I'm bone on bone, I've been living with it, I'm just trying to find an option to potentially get me a little more relief and ideally either put off a knee replacement or avoid it together, I think that the side effect profile for most of the rooster comb, which are known as visco supplementation injections, is very good. And the upside is potentially good too, where it may buy you a lot of time. I've had some patients with great relief and great success from them. And so I think at the very least, it could help you. At the very worst, you don't get much better. So I do think that that's an option in addition to the steroids and anti-inflammatories and stuff like that. What do, you, what do you think about the new treatments where they're trying to grow new uh, cartilage? Yeah, so that's an excellent question. And that's usually something that I get a lot in clinic too. I do a lot of cartilage work and a lot of it is for very focal knee injuries. I will tell you where we're at right now, we don't have the technology yet where we can just regrow cartilage for somebody that's in a bone on bone arthritis condition. If somebody comes in and they knocked off a pothole of cartilage, I can take a cadaver plug with live healthy cartilage. I can put it inside that knee to kind of fill in the pothole. 
we can harvest some of their, their actual cartilage and grow stem cells and reimplant that and that will grow back in, but that's only for certain size constrained defects. If you're bone on bone arthritis, unfortunately, despite you know people telling you you could squirt stem cells and stuff like that in there, there's nothing we have that's gonna basically grow back cartilage. And in that same vein, a lot of patients will ask me about stem cells and there's a variety of places people can harvest it for, platelet rich plasma, things like that. Um, what these basically are are biologics that, you know, platelet rich plasma is where we draw your blood, we spin it down, we get the growth factors. And really what it is is a biologic anti inflammatory. And there actually is some data for people with bone on bone or advancing arthritis where they get pain relief that's a little more durable than just a steroid injection. So I think that's probably the only one from a biologic standpoint that has some literature and efficacy for it. Most of the stem cells, you know, you'll read about people that will happily, you know, take lots of money and squirt them into your knee. But the reality is we just don't have the data and certainly not data showing that they're gonna grow any type of cartilage back. I think most of the time it's more of just a biologic anti-inflammatory response versus actually repairing and regrowing cartilage. Thank you for that information, I appreciate it. Absolutely. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that, the, the stem cells, mm -hmm. that type of technology is really advancing. Yeah, it's coming along and again, we can use it for po focal defects. Um, when I get you know laborers, when I get athletes, if they knock off a pothole or chunk of cartilage, uh, we certainly could take a cadaver bone where we, we, we literally take a fresh frozen cadaver, which is good for about 72 hours, they ship them in for the case. We can core that out and implant an actual bone and cartilage that's live, viable, healthy that will grow in. We can do that, we can harvest little peripheral pieces of cartilage and put it into different spots. And then we can also biopsy the cartilage. They can grow it in a lab and I can come back and put a little matrix in there and it grows their own cartilage back over time. And that's called a Macy procedure. So there's a lot that we can do for focal cartilage injuries, but just not globally growing cartilage at this time. Mm -hmm. All right, we have another caller. Uh, can you tell me your name and your question? James, hello James. Yes, I actually have. Uh, yes, James. my name is James. Go ahead with your question. And I have, I have two questions. Okay. Um, I'm 58 years old, and I like to go to the gym, and it probably I, I like to do squats and leg curls. And sometimes I find myself lifting a little heavy, and I was wondering over time is that really good or healthy for me at that particular age, or should I just stay at a moderate rate? Yeah. Of, 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 that's a really great question, and a lot of people ask that. I, I think that my general response for people in heavy lifting weights in particular is how much discomfort, number one, that you're experiencing when you're doing it. If it's something where you have good form, you have good technique, and it's not causing you significant pain, and you've been lifting and you're 58 and you're still lifting fine and doing these things, I think it's okay to continue. You know, if it's somebody where you're saying, hey, it hurts me every time I squat, should I keep pushing through it? Or should I modify and maybe lighten the weight, pick different exercises? Then in that scenario, I'd say, yes, it probably is good to back off. I do think over time, significantly heavy weights, if you're really beating and beating on the joints, that cartilage will break down. But again, it's purely based on how much it's bothering you now. I don't like slowing people down. I like keeping people moving. Mm-hmm, absolutely. Okay. Um, oh. James, did you have a second part to that yes, question? Yes, yes. My second question is, I like to walk in the neighborhood and stuff. And in my particular neighborhood, I found that it's just pavements on the street. And sometimes it can be discomforted. And I'm wondering, should I maybe continue to walk or jog? I like really jogging better than walking. Or should I go to a, a football field where they just maybe walk on grass? Or yeah. Walk? I think switching it up. I do think that pavement is tough on a lot of knees. So to that point, I think if you could either walk kind of in the lawns off to the side or make sure you have good footwear for cushioning, I think if it's really uncomfortable, switching it up to a softer surface is a good idea. And thank you, James, so much for calling. And we're running out of time. Gosh, this went by so fast. <laughs> we could talk about knee issues we could. They're still, on and on. Yeah, I could probably go another two hours and still cover everything else. <laughs> tell, tell us how people can reach you. Uh, we have the clinic. You can make online appointments. You can call up to the clinic um, and we'll, we'll get you in.
What's your phone number? 318-212-3610 uh, is the clinic number. Okay, great, because I, I know there's a lot a lot of questions. Uh, people have knee problems out there. I know I do when I try to squat down at the grocery store mm -hmm. to get it's something common. off the shelf. It's harder and harder to get up. But thank you all for, for watching us for Healthline 3, and uh, we'll see you again for another edition tomorrow. Have a great day. Stay healthy.